So the first thing I want to do is define formulas for you. Uh, formulas show the type and number of each element in a compound. Show type. And I'm going to say amount of each element in a compound. So one formula you're probably all pretty familiar with is water. So I'm going to write that one out so we can talk about what that's showing you. So this subscript here is telling you how many of the element to its left there are. So there are two atoms of hydrogen. And then we don't, as chemists, put in a subscript when there's one because we honestly wouldn't even put the symbol if there wasn't at least one. And because chemists tend to be really lazy, we don't write it. So there's also one, though it's not written, oxygen atom. So two hydrogens and one oxygen. So we know what elements are in the compound and then how many there are of each. Now, because we're not always writing and sometimes we have to speak, um, we, <laughs> we do have names for the different compounds. And there's a very specific way that we name things. In New York State, we have adopted the IUPAC naming system, which stands for the International Union of Physical and Applied Chem Chemists, I believe. And it's actually an international group of scientists that get together and they decide these things so that when you go from country to country, we all know what we're talking about. Um, when we do speak about different elements and compounds. So let me show you um, how we figure this out. We're going to go from the name uh, sodium chloride to the formula of that compound. So you may have already figured out what this is, but let's walk through it step by step. So sodium, in case you ever forget what element is what, they are listed in table S, and I only pulled in one of the pages of table S, but sodium is right here in table S. So you see the name and you see the symbol. And we're looking for the symbol. So I'm going to put this away for a second. So that means we definitely have Na. We're going to kind of ignore for a minute how many Na's we might have because that's going to be based on some other information. And we're going to record the other element in our compound. These ones are all binary compounds. Binary means there's only two binary, two elements in each compound. So this has sodium and it has chlorine. The ending here um, just kind of indicates that we have a binary compound. So if it ends in IDE, generally that means there's just the two elements in the compound. There's a couple exceptions and we'll talk about one later. So we also know there is chlorine in this compound. So our next step is to, now we know the type of elements, we need to know how many of each element is in this compound. And for that, we need to look at our oxidation numbers. So I'm going to kind of blow this up a little bit. Um, sodium, if you look here, has just one oxidation number. So that's the oxidation number we're going to record for sodium. And then chlorine, it being the last element in the compound, and I'm going to slide this over here so we can see it, is going to be negative. And when you look at chlorine, you'll see there's a whole bunch of oxidation numbers there. But because it is the last element, it's going to be negative, And there's only one negative oxidation number, and it's negative 1. So now what we need to do is make sure, because the whole point of bonding and becoming a compound is to make it so that everything's balanced out, everybody's happy, everybody has a stable octet as the outermost layer. Um, and in the process of doing that, it needs to end up with an overall charge of zero. So when we look at what we have here with one atom of sodium ending up with a plus one and one atom of chlorine ending up with a minus one, this does total zero. So our final formula is simply going to be NaCl. I'm not going to have you guys rewrite these. Um, but just so you know, we don't include oxidation numbers in our formulas, just the symbols. All right, let's try another one. Next we have beryllium, which you can always look up in table S if you've forgotten which element is beryllium. You don't have to memorize that. And then oxide is actually the binary form of oxygen, so that must be O. 
okay? So beryllium is going to be our positive oxidation state, and here's beryllium here. It's a plus 2, so I'm going to record that for beryllium, plus 2. And then oxygen, you're probably going to end up memorizing oxygen, only has the one oxidation number, and it is negative 2 just good because we needed it to be negative. It's the last element in the compound. Now once again this time having one of each is going to end up making it so these cancel out and our compounds total um, charge is going to be zero. So our, our final formula is just BE zero or BEO and again you, you're not going to have to rewrite these all the time. I'm just going to rewrite it so you know what it looks like in the end. We don't leave oxidation numbers typically in formulas. We need them in order to figure out the formula, but we don't leave them in there. Oh, I got a typo in the next one. There shouldn't be two S's in there. It should be magnesium fluoride. Be really careful with magnesium and manganese. They do look very similar, but magnesium is Mg. And if you had to look that up, might as well look up the oxidation number at the same time. It's a group two, so it's plus two. And then fluoride is the binary version of fluorine. And it only has one oxidation number as well. It's negative one. We finally have an example here where they don't cancel each other out. Fluorine would really like one electron, and magnesium would really like to give up two. And we need to satisfy both of them. So magnesium is going to lose two electrons, but only one atom of fluorine will pick up um, one electron. So we're going to need two atoms of fluorine in order to satisfy um, magnesium and fluorine. So our final formula is MgF2. All right. Let's do one more. Lithium is Li, and while you're at it, it is a plus one. Sulfur is sulfide, that's the binary form, is minus two. And once again, we have a situation where Lithium would really like to electron, I'm sorry, sulfur would really like two electrons, but lithium is only going to give up one. So in order to satisfy both of them, we're going to need two lithium atoms in order for lithium to get its two. So the final formula is Li2S. So if we were to come up with some rules for writing formulas, I would say you're going to um, write the elements, symbols, so we're going to write symbols. And then we're going to assign the oxidation numbers. I'm going to, of course, abbreviate. And then you need to balance them with subscripts. And that's all there is to it for um, binary compounds. All right, now we need to go in the other direction and take a formula and come up with a name. So the first here, um, we have calcium and then oxygen. And of course, you can always look the, the names up if you don't know them off the top of your head. So we're going to name the first element, which we said was calcium. And then we name the second element, but because it is a binary compound, we're going to drop the ending on that second element and change it to IDE. And with oxygen, it becomes oxide. All right, let's try the next one. K is potassium, Br is bromine, so this is potassium. And then for the second element, the last element in the compound, we're going to change the ending to IDE. And that is bromide. Next one, we have lithium and then sulfur. So we name the first. And then because it's a binary compound, the second element, we're going to change it to IDE. So this becomes sulfide. You drop the ending and add IDE. Last one here is cesium. And then for phosphorus, and this might not be something you would think to do, but for phosphorus it becomes phosphide. You might think, oh, you drop the us and it's phosphoride, but it's actually phosphide. So another good reason to have done this with me. So if we had to come up with uh, rules, we would say the first thing you do is name 
the first element. And then the second step is to name the second and change ending to IDE. And that's all there is to it. All right, next table. So before we can complete that, we need to define what polyatomic ions are. And polyatomic ions are actually covalently bonded molecules that have a charge. And we'll get more into what covalently bonded means, but essentially they stick together really well and they have a charge. So we kind of name them as if they're their own thing because they're going to stay together even typically through a reaction. So I want to direct your attention to a table you have in your reference tables. This is table E. And in table E, you're going to see a bunch of the polyatomic ions along with their names. So if you have a polyatomic ion in a compound, you can look it up in table E and it'll tell you what it should be called. How are you going to know you have a polyatomic ion? Well, when you look at the formula, if you see that there's more than simply two different elements, in this case there's three elements in there, then you know you must have a polyatomic ion. In fact, of course, I have a stupid rhyme, and it's if I see three, one, two, three, look at table E, okay? So if you see three or more capital letters, because for each capital letter, that's a new element, it must contain a polyatomic ion. So polyatomic ions, we're just going to write here, found in table E. And you're going to use that whenever you have three or more elements in your compound. So let's try naming some of these. So the, the rules aren't going to be that different from what you did earlier in naming. We're going to first name the first part of our compound. In this case, this is Na, which is sodium. So we're just going to write sodium. And then because I had identified right away that there were three or more elements in there, I know I've got a polyatomic ion in there somewhere. <clears throat> These are um, not organized terribly well in this table, so you're going to have to kind of pick around in there in order to find what you're looking for. Um, so I'm going to be looking for CO3. And here it is right here. Um, you want to make sure all of the uh, subscripts are the same and, and all of that jazz because some of these are very similar to each other. Like here we have hydrogen and then the CO3, which is actually similarly named as hydrogen carbonate. But the one we're going to be naming is actually carbonate. So this is sodium carbonate. All right, let's try the next one. Um, it's really nice when they, you have parentheses in a polyatomic ion uh, containing compound because it kind of separates out that polyatomic for you. So the polyatomic in this one is going to be ClO. So I'm going to name the first part here magnesium. And then I'm going to look for ClO. What you're going to find when you're looking for ClO, there's a whole bunch of them right here. ClO minus, ClO2 minus, ClO3 minus, and ClO4 minus. Since this subscript is actually outside the parentheses, it's not part of the polyatomic ion. It's actually there because of the oxidation number of magnesium. We want to name what's inside those parentheses, which is ClO, and that's hypochlorite. So now we can name the second part hypochlorite. And that's all there is to it. Next one also has um, parentheses, which makes this easier. So we're going to name the SR first, which is strontium. Again, if you need to look that up, no big deal. No shame. You don't have to be a big geek like me. All right. And then we're going to look for, in this case, it is NO2. This two outside the parentheses is because of strontium's oxidation number. So we're going to look for NO2. 
here it is right here in table E, NO2 minus, and it's called nitrite. So now we can name the second part, nitrite. All right. Next one again, IC3. There must be a polyatomic ion. So K is potassium, SCN. It's a lot easier for me to see where these polyatomics are because I've seen them quite frequently. You may find yourself sifting through this table a lot in order to find them. The more practice you have, the more likely you're going to be to recognize them. But most polyatomic ions, and I'm saying most, not all, most polyatomic ions are negative. So the first part of the compound is going to be separate from the polyatomic ion. If you look at the chart here, there are three, these first three, that are positive. And all the rest in the chart are negative. So typically if you have this metal at the beginning, that's just going to be the name of the metal. And the remaining part of the compound is going to be the polyatomic ion. So for this one, we have potassium by itself. And then SCN is the polyatomic ion, which you can see right here. Okay, so um, we're going to actually name that thiocyanate. Let me get that out of the way. So it's potassium first for the K, potassium, and then the SCN, we just looked in table E, and it's thiocyanate. Okay, on to the next one. This one happens to be one of those positive ones. But again, you may find yourself sifting through that table a lot to get to the, the actual name, but... Here it is right here, and it's ammonium, which sounds familiar, like ammonia. Ammonia is NH3, um, and, and actually when you dissolve uh, ammonia in water, you end up with ammonium hydroxide, and you can actually see the extra H there, and the OH here is, is water, HOH, or H2O. So the first part in this one is actually the polyatomic, so we're going to name that ammonium. And the second part is just a, a simple element. And whenever we have a simple element at the end, just like in a binary compound, we're going to change the ending to IDE. So it's not going to be chlorine. It's going to be chloride. And that's all there is to naming polyatomics. So if I had to write n rules for naming things with polyatomic ions, I would say name the first. And the first thing might be a polyatomic ion, or it might be an element. So depending on which you're naming, you would either need table E at that point or just use your table S to come up with a name from the symbol. And then you're going to name the second. And the second thing might be the polyatomic ion. If not, if it's an element, you're going to need to change the ending to IDE polyatomic you don't change the endings they stay the way they are all right so we have to be able to go in the other direction as well um, when these are all mixed in together it's going to be important that you can recognize when you actually have a polyatomic ion and one of the ways you can tell is that the ending isn't typically IDE it's actually in this case ATE for these two but it'll depend on what the polyatomic is, what the ending is. So now that I know I have a polyatomic ion, I can start by actually writing in the element. For this first one, it's silver, which is AG. But again, you can look that up. But I'm going to have to look in table E in order to figure out what permanganate is. So looking in table E now, I'm going to sift through and try to find there's perchlorate. Oh, there's permanganate right here. Permanganate is MnO4, and it has a little negative after that. It actually is giving you the oxidation number of that polyatomic ion. You give it as a, a total on the whole thing. And since they didn't put a number, we can go ahead and assume that it's negative 1. So I'm going to put this in its best, not that it's required, but it's best if you put it in parentheses. MnO4, and now I'm going to put the oxidation number on the outside. So the reason that I needed the oxidation number is the same reason we needed them when we did binary compounds. 
the two oxidation numbers need to cancel each other out. So I also need to look up the oxidation number of um, silver. So we're going to look in the periodic table and find silver, and here it is right here. It has just one oxidation number, which makes this easier. We'll talk about um, when they have more than one in just a minute. It is plus one, so I'm going to put my plus one here, and you can see that the minus one on permanganate is going to cancel out the plus one on silver. So we don't need any subscripts. So you didn't really need to have those parentheses, but I think it's best if you put them there. Um, and you'll see why as we do more examples that it's just safer to always put those parentheses there. All right, next example, we're going to do aluminum chlorate. So aluminum is going to be our single element here. And then chlorate is letting me know that it is a polyatomic because it doesn't end in IDE. So I'm going to need to look at table E. That kind of rhymes too. And I'm going to find chlorate. So here it is right here near the bottom of the first um, column. And chlorate is ClO3 minus. So I'm going to put that in parentheses. ClO3. And I'm going to put the oxidation number on the outside. Minus one, because that oxidation number is for the whole thing and not just on the O. So now I need to assign the oxidation number for aluminum, which is right here, has just one oxidation number, and it is plus three. So this time the two don't cancel each other out. So just like when we um, did this on the front side, we're actually going to need to um, do a little math, but I'm going to show you a shortcut. Um, when they don't cancel each other out and they don't have a common factor you can pull out, you can do what I call the swap and drop. And what will happen is you can put that 3 outside the parentheses on the chlorate. And then the 1 is going to go on the opposite side. So these are actually going to swap like so. Um, and the 1 would go on the aluminum. But like I said before, um, we don't write 1s. So really important that you have the parentheses this time, because if you didn't have this parentheses there, you'd have O33. Okay, so make sure you have the parentheses on that one. All right, the stock system. The stock system is part of the IUPAC naming system. And the reason why we have it is because when you come back into my um, stock room here, you're going to find that I don't have just one compound that has magnesium and oxygen. I could have four of them. Because when you look at, mag, mag, uh, not magnesium, manganese, when you look at manganese, it actually has four different oxidation numbers. So it could make four different oxide formulas. So it's important that when you name something that has multiple oxidation numbers that you say what the oxidation number is. So for naming with the stack system, I'm going to write gives oxidation number. of element with multiple positive oxidation numbers. And really we only do this if that element's the first element in the compound and I'll show you some examples now. So in this first one we have manganese and oxygen. I'm going to follow some steps and these steps that I'm going to be following are going to work for any time you name something, okay? So if you learn these steps, you're going to be good. It doesn't matter if it's a binary compound, one that requires an oxidation number, or one with a polyatomic ion. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to name the first thing. In this case, that's manganese. So I'm going to write manganese here. Then I'm going to leave a space. I say leave a space just in case. Because if manganese has more than one positive oxidation number, which it does, you're going to need to say what that oxidation number is after the, the name manganese. But I want to, I want to kind of finish the, the structure of this name first. So the second half of the name is going to be just the oxygen, like when we normally name a binary compound. So we're going to change the ending to IDE, and it becomes manganese oxide. But if that's all I said to you was go in the back, get me the manganese oxide, you'd get back here and you'd be really confused because I might have four of them back here. 
So I need to say which manganese oxide it is. So when we leave that space, we know we need to go and check on the periodic table, does manganese have more than one positive oxidation number? And it sure does. So we're going to need to say what that oxidation number is in the name. So now you've got to go back to your formula and assign the oxidation number for the element that doesn't have multiple oxidation numbers. In this case, that's the oxygen. Oxygen, when you look up its oxidation number, and it has to be negative because it is the last element, is negative 2. Since we have two oxygen atoms, that means we have a total of negative 4, and then the manganese needs to balance that so that it totals 0. Manganese, in this case, then, would have to be plus 4. This is the number that needs to go in the name in that blank spot. But, of course, it would be too easy if you just wrote a 4. We've got to make it a little harder than that. We're going to use Roman numerals. And the Roman numeral for 4 is IV. You can put the, the horizontal lines on there if you want. I'm too lazy to do that. All right, let's do another example. The next one, we're going to name the first, which is gold. Leave a space just in case. And we're going to name the second, which is chlorine. But we're going to change that to chloride, because when it's a simple element, you change the ending to IDE. And then we're going to look and check, does gold have more than one positive oxidation number? And it sure does. It has one or three. So we need to figure out which one it is. Chlorine being the last element in the compound needs to have a negative oxidation number. So even though it has a bunch there, you're going to use negative one. So negative one. And there are three of them for a total of negative three. The gold needs to balance that. It has just one atom of gold. So it's going to be a plus three. And that is the number that's going to go in that blank. But again, we have to use Roman numerals, so that's I, I, I. And again, you can use the horizontal lines if you want. All right, next one, don't be overwhelmed. It's not as bad as it looks. We have a polyatomic ion. I, C, 3, look at table E. This one has parentheses, so that makes it a little easier for us to identify where the polyatomic is, and it's CR207. So I'm going to name the first. PB is lead. I'm going to leave a space just in case. And then I'm going to name the second. And when you find this in table E, here it is. It's dichromate. So I'm going to put dichromate. And now I need to go back. Does this lead have more than one positive oxidation number? Here's lead way down here. It's a nice heavy metal. Um, it, it does. It has two or four. So we've got to figure out what it is. And I should have written in my oxidation number when I looked this up in the table E, but dichromate is a, a minus 2 or 2 minus. I don't care which way you do it. So that means that since there's two dichromates, that's a total of negative 4. There's just one lead, so that means lead needs to be plus 4 to balance that out. That, again, is the number that's going to go in that space but we're going to do it as a Roman numeral, which is IV. And that's how you do it. And those rules will work for anything. All right, let's try coming up with a formula. I think, actually, it's easier to come up with a formula because they've actually given you the oxidation number in the name. So nickel is NI. No shame if you have to look that up. It's going to be a plus 3. And then bromide is referring to bromine. So we need to look up bromine. You might know bromine by now because group 17s are typically negative 1. And there it is. It's got to be negative. So even though there's other positive ones, since it's the last one, it's got to be negative. Those don't cancel out. They don't have a common factor. So I'm going to do the swap and drop. And that 3 is going to become the subscript on BR. And it's going to be NIBR3. And I don't bother to write the one on the other side. Remember, don't bring the sign down as a subscript. The subscript is telling you how many of something you have. You can't have negative bromines. And then if you want to see the nice, clean, neat version, this is what it would look like. All right, next, germanium. And they've given us the oxidation number. 
and then, uh-oh, that doesn't end in IDE, so I need to look at table E. So I'm looking for hypochlorite, and here it is right here. Um, so it's CLO minus. I'm going to put that in parentheses. Always a good idea when you have polyatomics to put it in parentheses, and you'll see why, especially with this example. My plus 2 and my 1 don't cancel out, so I'm going to do my swap and drop. And the 2, very, very important, needs to be outside the parentheses. I have two CLOs. If you did not do that, and you wrote, and don't write this down because it's wrong, if you wrote this and you assigned your oxidation numbers, you saw they didn't cancel, and then you put the 2 here. This is saying that your formula has 1 GE, 1 CL, and 2 O's, but that's not true. It has 1 GE, 2 CLs, and 2 O's. So this actually distributes through those parentheses because you have 2 CLOs. And that is the end of our notes. I thought maybe there'd be more. Hopefully this makes some sense to you. We're going to practice a lot in class. Oh, I missed one up here. Here we have, um, how did I miss that? I was so excited to show you how to do the formula. We have mercury and then we have CH3COO. Um, so I'm going to name the first mercury. Leave a space just in case. And then I need to find CH3COO, and this is an interesting one. It's actually an organic uh, polyatomic ion. Here it is right here. Organic has carbon and typically hydrogen as well. And you'll see you have two options on how to write it. They used in this example this second one. It's still acetate. It still has a charge of negative one. It doesn't matter how you write it. Um, so the name acetate. And then we need to check mercury. Mercury does have multiple positive oxidation numbers. It can be one or two. So because this one in table E is a negative one, Hg must be plus one. So we're going to put that in the parentheses. All right, now we're really done.